Hello, hello, and a warm welcome to, well, very warm welcome to Holy Trinity this morning. I don't know about you, I'm quite warm today. It's great to have you all with us together again in the building and at home, if you're joining us at home. Uh, this morning, we've got lots to be sharing together. We've got next part of our, ki- oh, we've got a new kids talk series from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, later on, Matt Causia is going to come speak to us from Isaiah as well. We've got some songs, and all of them are being done by our band this morning, which is very exciting to have them here for the whole time. Um, those of you who have got kids in Scrambles and Climbers, um, if you can take them back, so through the double doors at the back to their room after the kids' talk. So there's a song after the kids' talk. If you can just take them out during that song, uh, and they'll be, these will be ready and waiting there for you. If you've got really little ones, you can hear mine squiggling away at the bottom there. Um, if you've got really little ones, there's a stay and play room right at the back for, if you want to take them out later on. There's a screen in there, so you're not missing anything, and you can still join in the service. Um, and afterwards, for all those of us in the building, we have got tea and coffee again in the car park. Although I'm going to ask, we need to make sure um, that we stay in groups of no more than 30. So there's a little divider this week in the car park. So we can just split ourselves off into two groups, just to make sure we're sort of keeping in, in line with the guidance, as we should be. But before we get started with everything else, let me just pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can gather together as your people this morning. And as we sing praise in our hearts to you and we are challenged by your word, I pray that we will just be shaped more and more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Now it's time to stand and have our first song. do take a seat there. What a, what a glorious song that actually is, isn't it, about our saviour, King Jesus. Uh, crown him, crown him indeed. Um, although if we're honest with ourselves, we, we don't, do we? We don't do that. We, in the ways we think and act, actually, we reject him. We don't put a crown on him, put a crown on ourselves. That's what we end up doing, and that is sin. We reject God and his ways. So this is a time when we can actually come together to say sorry to God for that. Uh, We're going to say the words of confession together, uh, which are on the screen, uh, either behind me or in front of you. 
Um, so let's pray these words of confession together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us and care for us all the time. We know that this week we have not always lived the way you tell us. We have done wrong things and not done all the good things we should have done. Only you can save us, so please forgive us and help us to live as your friends. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The amazing truth is Jesus has died and he has taken that punishment of the wrath of God for our sin and through him we are forgiven. We are truly forgiven and we have life. In a moment though, we're going to be having our kids talk and it's a new series from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but first we're going to have our reading from Mark chapter 10 as James comes to read to us. morning. The first reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Hi. Over the next three talks, we're going to look at three huge questions that will change your life. Two questions that people ask Jesus and Jesus' answers will change our lives. And one question that Jesus asks us that we need to take really, really seriously. So, first question. This was asked by a very rich man, a very rich man who came running up to Jesus, fell down on his knees in front of him and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Good question, huh? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's asking Jesus, what do I need to do so that I'll live forever after my body stops working? How do I get to heaven and live there forever? Which is a massive, massive question, isn't it? And it's a question that shows that this man knows that he doesn't yet have hold of eternal life. He needs something else. So we asked Jesus, what's missing? Now, I don't know what you imagine Jesus told him to do. Maybe you think Jesus said, well, you need to go to church every Sunday. Or you uh, need to pray three times every day for the rest of your life. Or uh, you need to make sure that you're really, really nice. Well, here's the first thing that Jesus says to him. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Now, in that one sentence, Jesus teaches this man two massively important things that we all need to understand. The first is that no one is good. Yeah, no one. Oh, we like to think that we're good because we compare ourselves with other people and think, well, I don't do those big bad things like murder and hurting people uh, and cutting down rainforests. But Jesus says you're not good because to be part of God's perfect kingdom You've got to be perfect. And every day, each one of us fails to love God as we should. And we fail to love other people as we should. And the second thing is we need to realize who Jesus is. Mr. Richman, why do you call me good? Only God is good. In other words, have you yet worked out who Jesus really is? He's God, and he's the only person who can give you what you really want, eternal life. And we need to realize the same two things as well. 
I am not good. And the one person who can give me what I really need is Jesus. Now, to help him to understand, Jesus asked him a bit more about his goodness. You know the commandments, said Jesus, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Yep, he said, I've kept every single one of those since I was a little boy. Jesus knew fine well that he couldn't have possibly have lived a perfect life because none of us has except Jesus himself. But this man thought he was perfect. In fact, he probably thought he was so good that God must be really pleased with him and so had made him rich. Hmm. Well, Jesus could have listed all of this man's failures, but instead Jesus lovingly said one more thing to him to teach him what he still needed. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Did you see that? Jesus isn't saying just do one more good thing and you'll have earned eternal life. He's saying you need to stop trusting in your money and your stuff because it's keeping you from me. And I'm the one person who can give you eternal life. So get rid of it and instead put your trust in me. Having money and stuff can't give us eternal life. Only Jesus can. And the reason that only Jesus can give us eternal life is because he's God come down to earth as a person. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to take all of our sinful failure upon himself and then rose again to new life, eternal life. The man had asked, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus says, you can't do anything. You need to put your trust in me because I've done everything for you. So what did the man do? Well, it's actually quite sad. Look at this. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He wanted to keep trusting in his money and his stuff. He wasn't prepared to put his trust in Jesus. His money and his stuff kept him from Jesus. And as Jesus watched him walk away, he warned his disciples Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And that seems impossible, doesn't it? I mean, a great big camel can't get through that tiny hole at the top of a sewing needle. And Jesus knows that there are some big, powerful things that stop people putting their trust in Jesus. For some people, it's their religion. Oh, I've been a member of this or that religion all my life. I'm not going to start following Jesus now. For some people, it's pride. Well, if I put my trust in Jesus, what would people think of me then? Well, for some people, it's goodness. I don't need to put my trust in Jesus. I'm good enough on my own. Thanks. And if that's what we're thinking, then we need to listen to Jesus' answer and realize just how much We need to put our trust in him because only he can give us what we really need. And if you are putting your trust in Jesus already, then let's remember the camel and the eye of the needle. We need to pray for God's Holy Spirit to soften people's hearts to him because that's certainly not impossible for God. Let's pray. Father God, help us not to be like that rich man. Help us to not trust in anything except in what Jesus has done for us. And thank you for your amazing gift of eternal life for those who do trust in him. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's sing our next song together.
Very good. In a, in a moment, we're going to actually say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. These are great statements of the Christian faith that we can say together to affirm to each other the truth of the good news of Jesus, and it's been transcending down many, many, many years. So I've just, you've just all sat down, but shall we all stand up again as we say these words together? Sorry, up and down today. But let's say these words, starting with, I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Do you take a seat there. So next, we are actually going to spend some time praying to our Heavenly Father. Um, so Steve is going to come and lead us in some prayers now. Thanks, Steve. Heavenly Father, fill us with your love and grace as we come to you in prayer this morning. Help us to know and feel your presence as you hear our humble words and thoughts. Let every prayer we offer work to guide us in the path that you have set for our lives. Lord, as we read in Mark 10, we are like the rich man who asked Jesus how to inherit eternal life. Help us to know and follow your commandments, and more than that, guide us to, to live and give away all the, the kinds of wealth that you've given us freely to help the poor and to follow you. You've given life and your love to each of us, Yet, when I consider the weight of my sin that led your son Jesus to suffer and die on the cross, I'm amazed and in awe that you should love me so much. That Jesus should bear all my grief and carry my sorrow is such a wonderful gift. Please help me to keep your love on my mind always, but especially in the tough times when I tend to forget that you are with me. Lord, please let your hand be at work in the decision making of this country's leaders particularly around the relaxing of the coronavirus restrictions this month in the face of huge rises in infection rates in our area. Let this move be right. Strengthen and support all of us whose lives have been touched by this virus and shield those who remain too weak to fight it. Lord, help those among us and known to us who are ill, suffering, bereaved or in fear. I'll pause for a moment so we can name them in our hearts. Bless them, hold their hand, and comfort them. Amen. Lord, we are so grateful at Holy Trinity Gates and for the inspiration you've provided us through Rod and his family in the time they've been with us. Help them to make an exciting and enjoyable transition into ministry in Sydney, to spread your word there the way they've done so here. Though we will miss them, help us to know that this year, help us to know that this is your wish and help our HTG Church family to continue to go from strength to strength. And finally, inspire the England and Italy football teams tonight to play a great and entertaining game for all the fans around the world. We pray for those who are working tonight, giving up their time to keep us safe and keep the supporters safe, help them to do their jobs, do them well, and know that we are so grateful for them. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Steve. Uh, shortly, we're going to have our next reading from Isaiah 53 before the Matt Causey is going to come and speak to us from the passage. Uh, but first, we're going to have our next song. So let's all stand for this song. I'll come up, so I've got no sit up to it, so I'll come up to it. 
so just, yeah, we just, if you, while we're praying in the end, we just leave and I'll come up and stop over. The second reading is taken from Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressions, transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Here ends the reading.
Thanks, Emma. Uh, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Matt, a member of the congregation here. I've got a question for you. Can you think of an apparently unsolvable problem? It could be minor. How to get a three-year-old to eat their greens. It could be intellectual. The millennium problems are maths problems so tricky, there's a million dollars on offer if you solve one of them. Maybe it's personal. How do I become more patient? Or it could be global. How do we solve climate change? Or maybe it's something else entirely. Well, there's also an unsolvable problem at the heart of Isaiah. In this sermon series, we have heard how Israel's and the nations around them will be punished for their sin. But we've also heard of the blessings that God will lavish upon his people. How do these fit together? How can God show mercy and reward his people whilst also judging them justly as their sins deserve? And the failure to deal with this fundamental problem is the history of Israel in the Bible. The cycle of Israel turning away from God, being punished, repenting, briefly enjoying his blessing before turning away again just to restart the cycle. None of the prophets, kings, judges God sent made any lasting difference. So how could faithless Israel become God's faithful people? And it's still our problem today. We all fail to love God with all our heart, soul and mind and to live others as we love ourselves and cannot be and cannot naturally be in relationship with the perfect God. Well, Isaiah 52, 15 contains a couple of hints that this passage is a picture of the Saviour, the one that can reconcile God's judgment and God's mercy. So firstly, we read that he is to sprinkle many nations. To sprinkle is an Old Testament image where the priest would sprinkle the blood of a sacrificed animal on the crowd to symbolically show that the animal had taken their sins and they were forgiven. And secondly, I don't know if you can recall back to Isaiah chapter 6, the very first thing Isaiah was told to tell the people was that they would be ever hearing but never understanding, be ever seeing but never perceiving. Well, at the end of verse, 16, sorry, verse 15, the kings will understand what they did not hear. They will see what they were not told. The man in these verses is the one that will make plain what was hidden to Israel and show how God's people will be saved. And the plan is wrapped up in one person, a suffering servant who came to be a substitute for sinners and who will be raised to eternal glory. And those are my three sections today. The suffering servant... Sinner's substitute and eternal glory. So, the suffering servant. This is the saviour that reconciles God's judgment and God's mercy. What kind of person would be expected? What do you think of when I say saviour? Maybe Superman, beyond human. Maybe Batman, dark and powerful. Or maybe Emmett from the Lego movie. Just an ordinary person that gives us all hope that we can be the hero. And Israel would also have had ideas about God's saviour. After all, God had sent many to save his people in the Old Testament. Judges, kings, prophets. And they're a pretty diverse bunch. So you've got Gideon, who is the least member of the least clan of Israel. And then you've got through Samson, who could fight a lion with his bare hands. To David, God's appointed king. But surely the saviour would be even greater, and obviously so. If David killed tens of thousands of God's enemies, well, the saviour would kill hundreds of thousands. If Samson was stronger than a lion, the saviour would be some kind of muscle mountain. And if Moses had to wear a veil because he had been in the presence of God, then the saviour will shine like a second sun. Well, no, verse 1 shows everyone was wrong. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord refers to God's power in action as part of his plan. And his plan hasn't been understood. No one believed that the servant described here could be the promised saviour. Surely there must be a mistake? 
I mean, look at verse 2. The servant is like a tender shoot, like a root in dry ground, vulnerable, not strong. We've got some little chili plants on the windowsill at home at the moment. And surely God's saviour should be more like an oak tree, sturdy, immovable, not like something that we will probably kill when we forget to water it. And verse 2 goes on. He has no beauty, no majesty, nothing to look at. I mean, a face only a mother could love. Not looking like God's king. And it goes further. Jumping back to uh, chapter 52, verse 14, people were appalled at him. He was disfigured beyond the appearance of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. I mean, maybe you've heard of Victorian freak shows where tragically people were put on show for money because of their abnormal appearance. I mean, that's the kind of thing that's coming to mind here. Or maybe people that have been horrendously injured, scarred, or burnt, their, their um, looks irrevocably changed. And the result of this is verse 3. The servant will be despised, rejected by mankind, who will be a man of suffering, familiar with pain, held in low esteem, even to the extent that people will hide their faces from him. I mean, why would people hide their faces look away and just refuse to look at him. If you want an example, go out into the street and see how beggars are treated, the refusal to make eye contact, the moving to the other side of the street to walk past, how they aren't acknowledged by many or valued. But I think we've got to save you. We can take one step further. Imagine that when you come up Durham Road into Gateshead, instead of seeing the Angel of the North, you see three crosses with men dying on them. Could you look them in the eye? Or would you hurry past looking anywhere but? In Luke 22, Jesus says that this chapter refers to himself. And a cross outside a hill on Jerusalem was his destination. The verdict from all around him is given in verse 3. Held in low esteem, despised, rejected, even by Peter, whom Jesus called his rock. And if one is, we're included in the we in this verse too. We don't naturally want to turn to God. We naturally want to look somewhere else for our satisfaction. And we're not really interested in God's verdict. So what can we say about God's saviour? Well, this isn't some superman floating above us. It's not some leader in some palace. It's not even an average guy. This is a man who has plumbed the very depths of what it means to be human. He's vulnerable. He's damaged. He's cast aside. Yet, this is God's ultimate saviour. The one that God has chosen to show his power and his plan through. And what is this plan? Well, verses 4 to 9 show the glorious truth that God's servant is to be the substitute for sinners the solution to the unsolvable problem of reconciling God's, God's justice and God's mercy is for God's servant to live a perfect life and willingly take the punishment for our sins to clear the way for us to be in relationship with him. Now, when verse 4 says, yet we considered him punished by God, it's implying a reasonable assumption that the servant is being punished for his sin I mean, in Isaiah, Israel is being sent to, into exile because of their sin, because they rejected God. I mean, sin has consequences, and the whole of Isaiah testifies to this. And therefore, just as in Job's day, they assume that the servant is suffering because the servant has sinned. But then we come to verse 5. But. This is not the case. So let's look together at what part we play and what part the servant plays. How do we fit into these verses? So verse 5, our transgressions, or acts that break God's law. Our iniquities, wrong behavior. Verse 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Turning away from God, looking to ourselves how to live, and not to our creator. 
we were made to be in relationship with God under his perfect and loving rule and yet have rejected him. We have nothing to offer God. We all fail to love God and others as we ought and deserve to be rejected by him. We deserve the pain and suffering mentioned in verse 4. Yet, in steps God's servant. What's his part in verses 4 to 9? Well, he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was punished. He was wounded. He took our iniquity. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. He was oppressed again. He was judged. He was cut off from the land of the living, assigned a grave. It couldn't be any clearer. The servant is being punished on our behalf. The pain and suffering mentioned back in verse 3 is a punishment for our sin. And the end of the judgment is death to pay the price that our sin ultimately deserves. So what is the result of his suffering? Wonder, did you spot in verse 5, there's one more thing that is ours. Peace. Such a small word. Such a big impact. Peace. Destroying the barrier between us and God. Peace. Allowing us to be in relationship with him. Peace. To be secure in his loving care. Peace to be able to enjoy all the blessings described in the rest of Isaiah. Can you imagine how peace sounded to the Israelites? Their historic cycle of rejecting God and being reconciled to him ended in peace. How does peace sound to you? Not needing to worry because God has accepted you, being free to live for God, knowing that the barrier between you and him is no longer there. Verse 5 is the very centre of this passage, the very heart of the good news God wants to share with us, that one came to take the punishment our sins deserve and to give us peace. Now, if you haven't heard this before, you might be asking, how is this justice? How can we say that God's judgment and mercy meet by punishing another for our sins? Now, if the punishment was at random, without the agreement of the substitute, then it would be unjust. But look at verse 7. Twice it says, he did not open his mouth. The servant did not protest at his treatment and accepted his role as a sacrificial lamb. This is a willing substitute, ready to take the suffering that we deserve. And the servant was uniquely able to take up this role See at the end of verse 9, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. This was a man who was innocent. He had never rebelled against God, had no sins of his own to pay for. In Acts 8, a eunuch asked Philip, who is the prophet speaking about in these verses? Imagine Philip's joy at explaining how these verses had finally been fulfilled in Jesus, making sense after hundreds of years. If you get a chance this afternoon, look through Luke uh, chapters 22 to 24. In Luke 22, 37, Jesus says that these verses are fulfilled in him. In Luke 23, we can read how Jesus was silent before Herod, as predicted in verse 7. And then Pilate states his innocent. As verse 9 puts it, there was no deceit in his mouth, and he had done no violence. Yet, see verse 8, who of his generation protested? No one protested. The crowd shouted, crucify! And then he was put to death, cut off from the land of the living, executed with two criminals, the grave with the wicked in verse 9. And finally, he was put into a rich man's tomb. 700 years after they were written, these words were fulfilled in Jesus. The words in Isaiah of how God can bless a sinful people who rejected him and deserve nothing but judgment came true in Jesus. The man who lived a perfect life yet experienced the very worst of human life, rejected by everyone, 
yet willingly choosing to die for us, that all who trust in him might know their sins have been paid for and have peace with God. We've seen what kind of life God's servant lived, a suffering servant, and we've seen what he came to do, to die as a substitute for sinners. But the passage doesn't end there. It ends in eternal glory for a servant brought back to life. Verse 10 shows that just as it was God's will for him to die as an offering for sin, the sacrifice that would take the punishment our sins deserve, it was also God's will that he would see his offspring. He would see the sheep that had gone astray, returning as his children forever. The servant's days would be prolonged. The New Testament makes clear they are eternal, without end. And those days will be glorious. Verse 10 goes on to say that the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. God's will or plans and purposes will be handed over to the servant. The suffering servant is made king, the rule over all things. What a turnaround. <laughs> from verses 11 and 12, he's gone from suffering into life. He was numbered with the transgressors, counted as sinful when he was innocent. He poured out his life unto death to bear the sin of many. Yet he saw the sin of light of life and was satisfied. He was accomplished what he was sent to do as he had justified many. And verse 12 puts it, he had, a, he had a portion among the great and will divide the spoils with the strong. The imagery here is of a conqueror sharing the fruits of his victory with his allies and subjects. And this is what Jesus did. In Luke 24, the women are asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. And later on the road to Emmaus, Jesus himself asked, was it not necessary that the Christ should, should, should suffer these things and enter into his glory? The cross was not the end for Jesus. He came back to life and ascended into heaven where he's waiting to make the whole world new and to call his children home. All who trust in him will have their needs satisfied as described in Isaiah chapter 55, will be comforted as in chapter 40, and will partake in the magnificent banquet described in chapter 25. All the blessings of God's mercy we have been hearing about through Isaiah will come true and so many more. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't mean that everyone will be saved. In verses 11 and 12, it talks about how the servant will justify many, how he bore the sin of many. He doesn't justify everyone. He doesn't bear the sin of everyone. As John 3.16 puts it, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus makes clear this offer is only for those that believe and trust in him. So where does that leave us? Have we really grasped the enormity of the unsolvable problem of Isaiah? How the faithless people can become the faithful people? How God's judgment and God's mercy can come together so that people like us who have sinned and rejected his rule can be at peace with him? If not, we miss out on the glory of these verses, that God gave a solution to the unsolvable problem. In Jesus, he sent a man who never sinned, and yet who suffered and willingly gave up his life so that the punishment we deserved was on him, and then rose again to life to rule over all things. Have you accepted this wonderful truth? If not, it deserves serious thought. It is the difference between experiencing God's blessing and experiencing God's judgment. If you want to find out more, then whyjesus.org.uk has a lot of information. Um, but if you have accepted the wonderful truth, then what would your reaction be if, as in Acts chapter 8, someone asks you to explain them to them? Would it be joy? Here is a golden opportunity to tell someone how to move from death into life 
to move from being under judgment, facing God's anger and without hope, to having their sins paid for, to being counted a child of our loving Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe if tomorrow someone asks you, what did you do at the weekend? Start with Isaiah. So let us pray now, praising God for his amazing plans. Heavenly Father, we naturally do not want to obey you. We do not obey your laws and deserve your judgment. Please help us to see anew this fantastic news that you chose not to leave us in our sin, but to provide a way for us to perfectly know you by sending your Son to live a perfect life in this broken world, to experience the very worst it has to offer, and to die on a cross, taking the punishment we deserved and giving us peace with you. Thank you that your mercy did not end there and that through Christ we will enjoy all the blessings we have heard about in Isaiah and many more. Finally, let us know the truth of these words and be prepared to tell others of them. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Matt. Uh, just to, before we finish our time together, just have a few notices for us. Um, so this week, some of our regular groups are on. So tomorrow morning, toddlers is happening. So if you want to book onto that, check the website for more details. Um, and Revive is on this week as well. Um, if you are uh, or you have a jam-aged uh, youth, um, they're meeting today at Holy Trinity. So here at 5:45 p.m. Don't worry, they're going to be finished in time for something else that's happening this evening. I don't know what that is. Don't know what would be interested in that. But don't worry, we'll be finishing at seven. Uh, no, there's no home groups this week, um, but instead we have our prayer meeting on Wednesday. That's at 8 p.m. Uh, be on Zoom. So do check the website for the details for that. Um, hopefully you've either received uh, an email from Ramsey Adcock, or you'll be receiving in the post a letter from him as well about what's basically what's happening, the shape of things that are happening over the next few weeks. Uh, and to, if you want to ask any more questions about that, we've got a governance Q&A on Zoom on Thursday at 8 p.m. Uh, this Friday, uh, our, is this Friday having a social? That's right, isn't it? At uh, the Woods House. So do get in touch with Sarah or Pete for more details on that. Uh, and lastly, our end of year barbecue has been moved. So that's now on Wednesday, the 21st of July. Just do, stay, uh, do be ready for more details of that coming up soon. Just a reminder, if you've got children in scrambles or climbers, do be prompt to go and collect them just so you can relieve the leaders uh, from their time. Uh, so before you go and get tea and coffee, so if you come out this door, if you go left to the far fire exit and come through the back hall um, to the one-way system and then you'll leave through the main entrance. Uh, if you've not got children to collect, just make your way through the fire exit here and to the right and around to the car park uh, for tea and coffee. Um, let's just finish our time together with some... Uh, it's a, yeah, some words from Isaiah that Matt read out to us there. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's remember those words from Isaiah this week as we go about our time together. Thanks for joining us.